Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming on um, board this evening. It's really good to see you. Um, thanks so much for your time this, uh, this evening. It's just great to see all your faces. I'm just scrolling through Zoom here. It's, um, it's always one of my, my um, favourite times, really, just to be able to go through and just see the whole community of people coming on board. And now we get down to, to business, if you like. And I just want to start by introducing uh, Julie Bentley and Simon Blake. And it's, I just want to say it's been my real privilege and pleasure to get to know them both over this um, this sort of past nine months, really, 12 months, um, just in having a small part in collaborating with, with a book that they've been that they've been curating and putting together. We'll speak more about that now, which obviously is the subject of tonight. Um, test to, the, to their hearts and how they... Of care very, very deeply for people. It's a privilege to have them on tonight. Now, Julie has spent her career in the charity sector where she's led a number of well-known charity brands. She's currently the CEO of Samaritans and was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by Charity Times in 2019. Along with Simon Blake, she wrote the book Sisters and Brothers, Stories About the Death of a Sibling. After discovering how little was written on the subject, following her own bereavement. And then we have Simon Blake. So Simon has spent his career in the charity and social sector. He's CEO of Mental Health First Aid England and Deputy Chair of Stonewall. In 2011, Simon was awarded an OBE for his services to the voluntary sector. Julie and Simon first met working in the sexual health sector back in 2009 and became good friends from there. So Julie and Simon, really good to have you here. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Really nice to be here with you all. So, um, by, by asking you uh, both, and if I can start with Julie and then go to Simon, but feel free to talk between yourselves. If you can just tell us a little bit about what brought you to write the book about sibling loss, sisters and brothers, what, what sort of moved you in that, in that direction? Well, probably Simon should start this, actually, because it was Simon's idea. But I think the first thing that's to say that's really important is we, we didn't write the book. We mm. have curated um, the book, which is basically a collection of um, uh, other people writing about the loss of their sibling. Um, we've both written a chapter about our own losses. He's holding it up there. Um, we have one chapter that we've written ourselves, but the rest is written by some other amazing people who shared their stories. Um, but I'm going to let Simon explain uh, how it came about because it was it was Simon's idea. Super, thanks, Julie. Um, so I was on holiday and uh, I go to a health resort and it was I was 45 and my brother died when he was 45 and I was holding my breath really I think to just check that I was going to make it until I was 46. Um, and my way of um, processing things is often to write uh, things and so Judy and I before that holiday actually just before the holiday had been out for supper where you know both of us like to read and we both said how surprised we were at how little there seemed to be that was easily accessible about sibling loss and how unique it felt as an experience um, you know in different ways you know both obviously have very different circumstances so um against my better judgment or against uh, or my best judgment, whichever way you want to, to put it, on a holiday committing to try and curate um, a, a book. But, and I wasn't drinking, it was a no drinking holiday. Um, I emailed Julie and said, um, I have a thought about trying to get together a group of people who would um, tell their stories uh, about sibling loss. Um, and A, do you think that's a good idea? B, if it is a good idea, would you do it with me? And there was a C, and I can't remember what the C was. Julie may be able to come in with that. I remember there were definitely three bits. But I think, for me, the real thing about it, you know, and I, I grew up gay in Cornwall and thought at the time that there was nobody else, you know, gay as in the, in the 80s, you know, pre-internet. But I honestly was really, really surprised when my brother died just how many other people had experienced that. And it just hadn't been part of the conversations before and I know that the thing that made helped me through it and still helps me through it is the conversations and so I just wondered I guess and why 
um, people went talking about it and wanted more conversations and and have been thrilled. You know, we're here tonight because of that. You know, that these conversations, which feel just so desperately um, needed, um, are, are happening. And perhaps it's because we're having them more and more. Or perhaps it's because we stepped into the space a bit. But Julie, what was the third thing? Actually, you said the third. Th your your second thing was the third thing. The first thing was I'm thinking about doing it. Do you think it's a good idea? B, if you think it's a good idea, will you write a chapter about your brother's death? And C, if you think A and B are a good idea, will you help me curate it? <laughs> okay, there you go. You wheeled me in very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that point about um, being surprised how many people you know who have lost a sibling, that absolutely was the, the same for me. It wasn't mm. until my brother Roy died and um, I'm somebody, as is Simon, who believes very strongly in talking about bereavement and grief and terminal illness. And in my brother's case, he was terminally ill for a number of years. Um, I was really shocked after Roy died at the amount of people who had been in my life for many years who said to me, oh, that, you know, I was really moving listening to you talk about your brother. I lost a brother or sister and then started to tell me. And I'd known some of these people for a long time and I'd never known that they'd had a, the, the death of a brother or sister. Um, and I think that one of the things that has come up through the book and that um, Simon and I have reflected on is there is something about losing an adult brother or sister that is complicated because where do you fit in the hierarchy of grief? Because an adult sibling uh, often has um, a partner, husband or a wife or partner, and, and that's a terrible loss if you lose, you lose your husband, wife or partner. They often have children and to lose your, your mum or dad is a terrible loss. They sometimes still have their own parents alive. And, and therefore, you, for, for me particularly, I kind of found myself thinking, well, where are, I'm so worried about all of those people. Actually, is there a place for my grief in this mix? And is that all right to have it? And that's definitely a theme that comes through time and time and time again in the book is I was second, third, fourth, um, and, 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 and was mine as well. Yes. Everybody seemed to ask about my parents, which of course they should, and I wanted them to, but it felt as though that was more significant. And I think that's why this conversation is so important. And it's one of the things you're, you met, you're talking about there is, is very much that, that silence that's 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 been met the the sort of lack of telling stories really um that sounds that sounds really profound it's almost mm. like the grief is denied mm. or i think people just don't think about it so you know simon got the question how are your mom and dad which was obviously i would ask people that question too and you know obviously i got the question oh my goodness how is his wife how are his girls how are his grandchildren which are all entirely relevant and right and proper questions and i indeed thought believe their grief is greater than mine their loss mm. is greater than mine to have lost their partner and their mm. husband of 40 years and their dad definitely i think their loss is greater than mine um but I think what, what I then did with that was struggle to find, allow myself the place that was right for me in terms of my grief mm. about the loss of a brother who I absolutely adored. Mm. And, and I think, um, Andy, the bit which was, I, I, I guess, I don't know if it was a surprise. I apologise that I'm starting to look like Trump. I've got awful lighting in this conservatory and there's nothing that I can do about it. But um, the thing which I... Uh, I was really striking through the process of this was how cathartic it was for the people who contributed mm -hmm. and some of the conversations that we had um, as, as a result. Um, and a number of people said, I've not, I've not had these conversations before. Um, and they were really important conversations as part of the grieving process. Writing it um, was really important. And then having the conversations with the people around me because the other bit which I think is interesting, and certainly I just had a quick read of, of mine, if you look with, a, um, with a, a particular lens on, you can think, so you wanted it to be all about you, did you? <laughs> and of course, that's not what you want, but you want there to be space for you um, and that actually trying to find that space. Um, and, it, and in my particular case, actually 
feeling as though I needed to compensate for the absence with his children, with his wife, with my parents. And, 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 and that, that you take on an extra responsibility at the same time that you're not dealing with or not, not talking about um, potentially um, your, own, your own experiences. And, and, and that becomes even more the case perhaps where you know, if it's a, a, a death which uh, people, yeah, my family talked about it, you know, all the way, all the time. Um, but whether your family culture mm. traditions don't talk about it or they're shame associated, um, it's actually yeah, really quite complicated um, scenarios. Um, but yeah, finding your place, I think. Um, and my mum's just died recently, and it feels very, very different. Yeah, you know, just none of those things. And so, so there is something which is 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 really. Um, makes me really believe that this conversation about sibling bereavement and grief um, is really, really important. Mm. I think Simon and I were both mm. really struck by how many of the contributors who I think have, they've, they've, they've written the most beautifully moving um, accounts of their relationships with their siblings, but we were really struck by how many of the people that contributed really actually struggled with doing it and sharing their story. And then some of them have really struggled with whether to, how much to show of their, their family about what they've done. So, so a number of people who have contributed this book still haven't shared it yet with their family um, because they haven't talked mm. to the family over the years about how they felt about the loss of their sibling. And they've now put it in a book <laughs> and some of them still haven't even mm. shared it with their family because they're still trying to work out how to do it because they know it's going to be the thing that starts the conversation in their family about that family loss that they haven't had the conversation before. And it's probably mm. worth saying that I'm also one of those. And the reason that I'm one of those that hasn't is because my mum was diagnosed with terminal uh, cancer as we were doing the process. And so it didn't ever feel like the right time to talk um, about it, but I do need to and want to have the conversation, but give us a few more weeks probably. But the lots of, even if that hadn't happened, it would have been, complicated to know where to start because as I said it can feel as though you're saying um uh, it, it wasn't good enough for me and that's not what's intended at all you know in in, in any of it and that's some of the conversations had it's literally that you just that there are lots of different things which mean that you step into roles which put other people mm. in front and I, and I think, think I would still do the same again <laughs> Yeah, that, that's the other bit in it. You know, so even though you say, do I like it to be different? I think all of all of us um, you know, would probably say, actually, there wouldn't be much different that you would do because those hierarchies, those thoughts, those responsibilities still exist. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Julie and Simon. And Simon, I just want to say I'm really sorry to hear about your mum. Um, thank, you. thank you for sharing. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask you ask you a question and and I'd like you to both talk about it for a little while. Um, unapologetically, what I need to do is is just correct a bit of an IT issue here around my power. <laughs> Put, um, myself on mute, my screen on off, my video off for a, for a moment, but I will be with you. Um, so I do apologise for that. Well, I will apologise for it, but I will fix it and I'll be I'll be I'll be here wanted to ask you just while I'm, I'm fixing that was one is what I wanted to ask you anyway which was when you approached other people about contributing to the book um what was their what was their reaction because clearly this is a deeply moving thing that that many people have kept silent about for years and years mm. um shall I start is it worth just saying how we how we went about doing it yeah That'd be really helpful. Yeah. You do that, Sai. Well, I think, I mean, it's, it's fair to say that we asked a lot more people than contributed. And some people said yes um, and then didn't. Um, and then, you know, in the same way that you do when you edit a book, you ask again. And 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 then we, uh, I, the people that I had approached after the third time, if I approached them and they were saying yes, I just didn't. And actually a couple just still not said why they didn't but some people said no um it's too long ago or it's too recent or but essentially we we wanted to make sure 
that um, uh, that we had a, a a networked way into asking because it is a, you know a, a sensitive uh, thing to ask somebody you don't know or sensitive is that right? It's not the sort of thing that you necessarily um, you know will just ask people in the street or put an open call because you're also you're asking people to trust you with their stories um, and their experiences and to know that you're not going to do anything um, to, sanit to sanitize it, I guess. And, um, and so we, 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 by the time we came to doing this, we knew quite a lot of people who had experienced death in various different ways. And we knew other people who knew people. And so we just took a networked approach through and, and, and people were either very quick to say yes or no. Once they'd said yes or no, people literally did it within days and it arrived. Um, or it was a long time and you reminded them and then it arrived in days. It wasn't like a normal piece of work which you, which you could do and then you revisited and you revised. And then some people took it away after they'd given it um, to us. But people mostly said that they said yes without talking to their family and then realised that they needed to talk to their family and then they needed to talk to their family about the things that were going to be um, in it. Um, and everybody felt incredibly nervous before it went into the world. Um, and um, uh, yeah, felt incredibly vulnerable. And if you haven't read it, I really would... Um, uh, recommend it. All profits go to the cruise. So you invest in the work that is uh, brilliant work the cruise is doing, um, like, uh, like, like these sorts of events tonight. But people have told with raw honesty the things that they would like to have known or the things that they would like to have thought. And I guess the only other thing I would just say is we had a long conversation, can't remember if it's Festival Hall or Albert Hall, at Festival Hall, the one South Bank, wasn't it? Um, about whether we gave people questions or whether we just asked them to tell their story. And we asked, decided in the end to just tell the story. Um, and, uh, and some people said, can you ask us questions? And we, we resisted. Um, but actually lots of people follow that very much about their path, what it meant for them in their family. Um, and some a, a bit more um, talk about that either the individual or the very specific relationship. Um, does that answer your question? I mean, I think I think everybody there was a there was a visceral yes, I would have loved this, and then a yes, I want to be part of it, or it's too much, I can't. And and some people wavered. There was a there was more than one person who said yes, and then a week later came back and said, actually, no, I've decided, actually, I can't do that. And and then a week later came back again and said, no, I think it's really important that I do this, and and just found it really nerve wracking. And there was also a couple of people who said they would do it if they could have pseudonyms so that they didn't need to share with their family that they'd done it. Mm. And we said, yes, they could, because for us, the important thing was that people's experience was shared for others to find comfort in or, or learn some stuff from. But actually, both of the people who asked if they could have pseudonyms at the very last minute, both decided to go with their own identities in the book. Mm. Um, so... So kind of they'd worked through the, you know, actually this is something, an opportunity for me to finally have the conversation that I, that I should have with my family about this. But mm -hmm. yeah, high levels of anxiety with, with certain, um, particularly with certain people. Mm. It's also worth just saying, and I, I think we probably underestimate how much we did this, but thinking um, about, um, diversity of experience, both in terms of the types of death, but also the cultural tradition um, and, and, and background. So, yeah, we've got people who've written about losing um, a sibling to suicide, um, to accidents, to you know, road traffic or, or drowning, or otherwise to HIV, to cancer, um, uh, to heart failure. Um, so there's a, a really wide range of of um, of experiences, and and I think what's so interesting is that um, even though society may place different values or beliefs or systems around different things, that actually at the heart of the experience, the the pain and the 
the loss and the hurt and the guilt and the desire to do something differently as a result of it is very, very, very similar. You know, it, it's that there are a number of things um, which sit outside of some of the, or, you know, the usual things uh, which you read about when you read, read about grief and bereavement. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've come to that because I want to respect that everyone's story is individual. And, and at the same time, um, I was, I'm keen to ask, what are the common themes that you feel really came through those stories mm. um, partic that are particular around adult sibling loss? I'll, I'll give a couple and then um, then hand over. So for me, a couple of the themes, there was the theme around proc age of yourself and the age of your sibling when they, so obviously some people, um, siblings died many years ago. So some siblings were older or younger, but there's definitely a theme around, um, you know, if, the, if you were younger and you had reached the age that your sibling was when they died, um, what that mm. meant. If you had become older than your sibling would ever have been, that, that was a real theme as well. Um, if, if the sibling had died young from um, health conditions, the impact on your own sense of your own mortality and making you think about, oh, okay, do I need to actually consider that maybe I won't live to old age either if my sibling didn't. So something there about the proximity of you in relation to that sibling. Um, mm. There's one very moving story that was written to two of the contributors to the book. Um, the sibling that they lost was one of a, a, tri a triplet. Um, and so their telling of the loss of, a tri of, one, of their, one of their triplet siblings is particularly um, moving really in terms of that sense of being part of of your of yourself. Um, so I think I think that is one theme. And then the other very strong theme, which we've already touched on, is the one of knowing where you are in that ranking of grief when it's your sibling that has mm. died. It's um, mm. a very strong theme. What mm. else would you say, Sai? Um, so I think the other is about um, perhaps a unexpected sense of um, relational relationship so that's not very so how 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 significant the relation you your relationship to them was in your own identity mm -hmm. um, and, and 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 where you are in relation to to them and sort of a Judy I think you used the word about anchoring mm -hmm. um, and then yeah you know, there are um, a number of us in there who yeah, as you just said, either lost a twin or a triplet or the only sibling. So it's like, well, where where am I now? So not just, you know, what what is, is, is there? So I think that was a, a really powerful thing that when I read the rules, that sort of sense of of, of um, discombobulation, for want of a better word, you know, about your own mm. life and where, where you are. Um, I think the second piece for me is that um, determination to um, never let your parents, if your parents are alive, to, fe to feel that pain again. And obviously you don't have control over that, but, but that sort of sense of responsibility because it's um, uh, yeah, an, an overwhelming thing to watch. Uh, you know, that was the, the, the sort of the conversations um, uh, from that. And then I think that sort of sense of, um, uh, of your own, the value of your own life, you know, that how significant an impact it, it makes. And, and that's a good thing from a gratitude perspective, but did I ever match up? Was I ever good enough? Was I mm. at all of the family events? Did I make everybody happy? Did I get the good enough job? <laughs> you know, so it's sort of trying to, to, to deliver on more than one person's life in gratitude that you've got yours, but also in sort of expectation um, for, for some others, um, those would be those would be I think some of the key key things. Um, and 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 then I guess the only other would be a force for good. Yeah, you know, that actually if you look and it, mm. you know, I have to say there's there are clearly a number of people because of the nature of the work that Julie and I have done who we reach through social sector. Um, and but that sort of sense and particularly I think Ben's story. Yeah, about actually this was so awful the only thing that mm. I can do now is use this to drive 
to drive um, good. And I remember um, uh, Misha Paris on Songs of Praise just before Christmas. Then, you know, her brother was murdered about 15 or 20 years mm. ago. And she was talking about it um, on Songs of Praise just before Christmas. And she just said, you know, your life either becomes worthwhile because of them or your life becomes worthwhile because of the cause that's associated with how they how they died you know and, and something sort of channels within and I think there's a, an element of that in this which is you know I, I've, I've realized that I've got to do things differently because of them so Ben you know dedicating his very young life uh, to, you know, and doing absolutely remarkable things about mental health and because his brother uh, took his own his own life and, and other examples um, in the book, which I think reflect some of that. And, and, and I'm really glad you bring up the uh, force for good there, uh, Simon and Julie. And you know, part of this is, is, is what we can learn from these stories, from these treasured stories. Um, what would you say are some of the things that we can do to, to support someone who's lost a sibling whose siblings died um, what particularly is is going to be helpful if that's the right word mm. I think one of the obvious things would be to 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 ask them how they are <laughs> um, mm. and for that to not be just an afterthought if anything but to actually recognize that they their grief and loss is is that they're alongside the other people's grief and loss and that they may well, um, many people in the book talk about having their own sense of grief, but also needing to support other family members. And so it's something about how can you support them with their own grief and loss? And how can you support them to be able to support their other family members as well? Because often it mm. falls to them to do that. Mm. I mean, so a long time ago, um, and it's sort of on the periphery of my career, we worked I worked at the National Children's Bureau, which hosted the Childhood Bereavement Network, which is still there. And actually, I think there are lots of lessons from childhood bereavement support that could be mm -hmm. applied into sibling grief. But how do you create the space for the children to feel it? You know, and, and, and we will always be the children <laughs> you know, in, in the, some of those sorts of, of situations. So I think there's some learning there and, and, and thinking about that. The bit which I, um, uh, so we knew my mum was dying for three few months before she did, and we talked quite a lot about um, my experience of my brother dying. She said she wished that she had had somebody to help her to think about what she could have done to have helped me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so which is the other, the flip side, you know, that actually, you know, um, she, you know, her, her instinct was to protect me, but had no idea how to do it. <laughs> Um, mm. and, and of course had no, you know, I was 40, you know, it didn't need that, but something about how do you, how do you walk this path together, mm. uh, you know, through that, whoever that together is, whether it's with a partner, um, you know, or, and, you know, I know my partner certainly got in the neck <laughs> several times, you know, shortly, shortly after. So how do you walk with somebody and certainly people who are affected differently in, I guess, you know, in that sort of family system uh, I, would be the bit um, which, which I think would be you know, incredibly important, as Judy said, whether that's your sister-in-law or you know, the, the grandchildren or, you know, I, I know, for example, I was just thinking um, uh, tonight you know, that uh, I suspect that my brother's children also may at times have thought that my grief was more important than theirs. You know, they were that sort of age where they also, one was an adult, um, and, and we've had various conversations. It's like, actually, it's not about the hierarchy, but it's how do you walk side by side with each other, recognising the different relationships. Mm. And I, I think if we can be clearer about there is about that and about some of the forces, you know, which, you know think about that sort of gestalt, <laughs> you know, sort of model of the, of the system or, you know, that sort of bit about how you're so tightly intertwined, how do you untwine them? in order that then when yeah that people can just think a bit when you're not at your best I mean that's that's the other bit which I honestly thought that I was absolutely fine um it was only six months later when I laughed again when I found myself dancing to music and you know those sorts of things that I realized how unfine um I had I had seen and I 
uh, and I think again that our whole um, our whole approach to bereavement is so peculiar, isn't it? You can have your five days off and you go to the funeral and yeah, then you come back to work on the Monday rather than yeah, how do, how do we in advance of this start thinking about actually what might be the things that would happen? How would you know? How would people know whether to support you, how to support you, what happens in the workplace, all of those sorts of things. I think I think one of the other things people can do to be supportive is I think sometimes and well always, you know, families are uh, have different re- ways of dealing with things, don't they? And and some families can talk talk about things such as death and bereavement. Some families don't, but it's actually mm. when you in a family system, you have some people who don't want to talk and others that do want to talk. Mm. Um, you know, I'm certainly somebody who would always want to talk about bereavement. Um, I, I you know wanted to talk about terminal illness. Um, my mum was terminally ill. We talked a lot during her um, final years of life. Um, so I think that if you are trying to accompany somebody, not just with sibling bereavement, actually, but any bereavement, it's understanding what it is that's their need and their, you know, what do they need from it. But actually encouraging people to talk because naming, naming the really dark, deep feelings that come with grief and bereavement and with the fear of impending death, if it's a terminal illness, actually they are really, they can be really dark places for people to be. Mm. Um, and listening, letting people know that they can talk, you can hold it, and that you can listen in a really meaningful way, um, I think is invaluable. And, and these are massive gifts to give, aren't they? Um, I mean, what, one, I want to ask in a moment just about, you know, there are people on here who will have experienced, come on to that in a moment. But but one of the things I wanted to um, sort of ask about really is to come back to the intertwinedness that Simon was talking about. You know, often what we what we speak about, certainly within crews in the bereavement sector, is actually when someone dies, you don't just stop relating to them. You know, the relationships carry on. And those those relationships, they the 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 wonderfully warm components of them carry on really difficult ones. I wonder if there's any sort of wisdom you can share um, or anything, anything from stories you can share about, about how to cope when perhaps that intertwinedness is difficult. You, you broke up just in the middle there, so I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure I heard entirely what all of the middle bit of that question was, Andy. I'm really sorry. Um, That's all right. Um, shall I repeat myself? Technology is not being our friend tonight. Yeah, could you? Yeah, because you're kind of breaking up every kind of yeah. few words. So, sure, sure. So, so to be brief, we we often talk about how relationships um, they don't end when someone dies; they carry on. That the part of the relationships that we that we enjoy and the parts we find really difficult. Simon talked about that intertwinedness. And I just wondered if there's anything you can share about, you know, if those relate with the, if we've lost, if, if, if a sibling has died and perhaps feelings that were left hanging, mm. um, perhaps, perhaps forgiveness that wasn't sought or wasn't given, how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that? Yeah. Or well, how are people the, dealing with that, perhaps? I think I can't. I'm trying to think about the different stories in the book. Um, there definitely were complicated relationships mm. in the sibling, you know, in some of the sibling relationships in the book. Some of the siblings considered themselves to be the guardian of, of the sibling that had died because they were older and they saw it as their job to look after. And then, of course, the person died. Mm. Um, some of us were much younger than, um, than the sibling who died and kind of saw them more as a kind of parental figure. Um, and yeah, there was there was you know there was rivalry and there was you know not they weren't all um, you know rose roses uh, and love heart relationships. Mm. I mean, I think from my my view on um, how you manage your grief when um, you know there was complexity in the relationship, but then you know my answer to everything is talking about it because you know 
complexity, difficulty, rivalry. I saw the word rivalry just now in the chats. Um, you know, none of those things mean that you haven't the sense of bereavement and the sense of loss isn't there. Um, and sometimes the most cathartic thing to do can be to say, do you know what? I mean, my, my brother, I adored him. We couldn't have been more different. Chalk and cheese pretty much didn't have the same view on anything. Um, but I still adored him. He was my big brother. And, you know, I was allowed to say that I disagreed with lots of what he said and thought. But, you know, no one else was allowed to say anything bad about him. Um, but I think that it's important to just be, be able to say it out loud. You know, what was it about your sibling that you could cherish? What was it about your sibling that maybe was really difficult? Um, and actually, maybe the difficulty has been, is gone with their death. And that might actually bring some feelings of relief with it as well. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> My screen is just sure what's happened there. <laughs> While you work out what's happening, Julie, shall I just pick over, <laughs> take over? Well, yeah, something's yeah, happened. Yeah, Simon, not... you want to take over? It looks like, there we go. It's not me. Yeah, I didn't touch anything. Back in the room. <laughs> um, so the, so I think, yeah, the, the, my, me and my brother were absolute chalk and cheese. Um, and yeah, we, you know, and we, I've really missed him in this last six months and I've been dying, but he would have been bloody awful. Yeah, you know, there would have been no help whatsoever in this circumstance. And so, of course, you can have a love affair, can't you, with, with, with it and with everything that it represented and, and it represents and all of those things in the same way that as children, you know, we used to squabble yeah, just, you know, as boys, I mean, you know, if you, I put a blog in there, you'll see that I, you know, I made sure I put we on my hand and put it on the sherbet lemon so that my brother had when we were 11. I'd probably do that at 45, you know, if, if he was still, if he was still um, around. So I think, I guess you have a choice, don't you? And, and it's, grief is complicated um, depending on the circumstance, but there is also the bit which is that sometimes, you know, you, the letting go of the bits which weren't perfect is as important as the holding on to the things that were cherished or you know i mean i i you know caused a, a, a sort of family um argument when i told people at my granddad's funeral what a pain he was you know, in his eulogy but you know loving people for the wholeness yeah. um of, of, of what they are but i think julie's point about um uh having the conversations you know, the own the only thing, yeah, you know, whether that's in the family and you can have it in the family, or whether whether it isn't, um, and 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 I think, you know, more and more, the bit which I really learnt um, about with mum more than my brother's, my brother's death was very um, sudden, um, was that the conversations themselves don't get easier, but having the conversation and starting the conversation does, <laughs> because a little bit like anything else. Um, you know, that once the first sentence is out of your mouth, then you can keep on going. But I guess the only other thing that I would say is I'm a great believer in if you're going to say it, you've got to be sure you want to say it. <laughs> um, and that you know, once you once you said it, even if it was in an argument or even if it was in anger, it's said. And it and these, you know, however brilliant we are as human beings, um, you know, they sit at the back of our mind and then they become part of part of that sort of grief process um, as well. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful at all, but I guess it's I guess it's that is it like anything, isn't it, that we often assume that other people's experiences are not complicated. And the reality is that when people are alive, relationships are complicated. It's what we're able to do as part of the ending. Um, and if, we, if we're lucky enough to have notice of the ending and to be able to create the ending, and if if we're not with the person, then how do you how do you do that for yourself? Mm. Mm. And then, and there's 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 lots of sort of preparation for death is is really important as much as that might be possible, although often it sometimes isn't. Yeah. Um, one of the th one of the themes that's coming through on the chat, and thank you everyone for for posting um, your questions and your comments. We'll get to as much as possible. Is um, is the theme of of what's been referred to as survivor guilt, 
that sort of sense of being the last person standing, if you like, or the person left behind. Um, was there any any advice or any sort of experiences coming through the stories that you could draw upon to um, perhaps ad advise, really, um, that if someone's listening, if someone's here, and they're experiencing that type of feeling of being the last person, what perhaps can bring some um, consolation or support? I think in the book there are two or three um, exam stories where people um, feel very much the weight of still being here, or when their sibling isn't. Um, particularly um, some of the stories where the siblings were um, part of triplets, etc. And also, I think when the sibling had maybe um, taken their taken their own life as well. Obviously, that also comes with um, a degree of additional complexity. I would say. Um, I don't think it's for me to give advice really about mm -hmm. about survivors, about the, the the challenge of you know guilt around surviving. But again, I think it's important to talk about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, um, I think that sometimes survival or feelings of survival can displace displace your needs to just allow yourself to feel the grief actually um i think that's what i would say about that and, and, and i guess yeah so so i felt it really really strongly so you know i'm the first person in my family that moved to london um my brother lived nearby my brother saw my parents most days um and had children um and one or possibly two grandchildren I can't remember um but you know one grandchild so it was it was enormous it was absolutely um enormous in my mind I just couldn't think of any reason um and I I don't have any advice except that at some point I said I just had to accept that it was as it was um and that I then therefore had to do the best that I could you know in the circumstances um, that that I could and and um, and and life has a funny way of of you know holding out. So one of my big fears was what would happen when my um, when one of my parents got ill and and of course I was able to move home. You know I've been in Cornwall for seven months um, uh, now. Um, or, um, and and so it's it's in that deep dark imagining. I think it's is how to how to speak that and how to enable those things to. Um, to, to be spoken about in a way which feels safe and and yeah I was just struck as you were talking Julie the thing that um, we kept in the book we kept on trying to think about how to introduce it so we said that we wanted to achieve three simple things um, one greater awareness that lots of us will and have experienced the death of a sibling and the uniqueness of that experience for each of us Two, that there's no right or wrong way of grieving. And three, that all feelings, thoughts and emotions are valid and important. And in writing this, wanting to find people to find the stories useful, healing, validating. Um, and, and, and I think what, yeah, for anybody who hasn't read this, um, you know, and I, we're getting absolutely no money from it. I just want to be really clear, this is not a sales push, but, um, a friend of mine who hasn't uh, lost sibling just said, "I can imagine um, when I when I do that, I will pick this up and it will hold my hand." And and that's actually what I don't know what was it five years I guess well, for just over five years after, and that's what it felt like it did. It was like actually all of those things you felt were all right, <laughs> all those things that you felt. So it's interesting, isn't it? When you do things, you realise perhaps some of the things you're hoping to do for others are also the things that you want to do for yourself. Just while I've got the conversation, I saw something which may not jump out as a big um, a big issue for you, Andy, but I just want to say, mm. somebody talked about memories and losing their childhood. Um, mm. And um, I wrote down um, two blogs of memories, which is in the blog bit. And it was the most wonderful, wonderful evening um, that I spent um, on my own. I had confessed to you know, three or four large glasses of wine, but I laughed and I cried and I remembered and and I would encourage you to do it because the mm. bit which I as a, as the only um a sibling nobody else um remembers yeah actually there was so well in my experience nobody else remembered and um 
when when mum was ill, we were, went through we went we had an amazing holiday to Disneyland when we were kids. Could have been four different holidays, and I could or three different holidays. And I kept on thinking, if Andrew was here, he'd back me up. He'd know that mum was mean and wouldn't buy me roller boots, or you know, he would have remembered that. And and all of those sorts of things. And I think that was precious. And so I have a book now, which I just write memories as I remember them, um, because it's something. Just every now and then, you get that. Oh God, do you remember that? And there's no one to check it with. And so it so that just really resonated um, in that. Yeah, I think that's right. The sharing of memories mm -hmm. um, was something that everybody who contributed to the book said was so important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, because you don't get those same memories with anyone else. No, exactly. And there's something in there about, um, for me, certainly, the sense of injustice of a sibling mm. dying is because it's not that's not meant to necessarily be the case. You know, in the order of things, you expect your parents to die first but you expect your siblings to grow old with you um and there's something you know deeply difficult about your siblings going especially before their time um mm. and and that was that was i think a theme as well a bit of a theme of hold on a minute you know we should be going through a <laughs> journey called life together um it shouldn't be that i find myself without them at this point mm. When, when I was reading um, part of that, the book myself, I remember thinking that that phrase, it's not fair, but that didn't, that didn't really do it justice. It didn't, I, think the I, words... said, I think I said that in my chapter. I felt yeah. like it just wasn't fair that my brother mm. had died. You know, my parents both had died many years ago and I had the comfort of um, a brother and sister that were both older than me. And then for my brother to die when he did, it was just like, well, hold on a minute, this is just not fair. I've already lost mm. my mum and dad, and it's just simply not fair that I now lose, lost my brother as well. Mm. Um, which, you know, it's quite childlike, but it was real. I really felt that. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's really real, isn't it? I, want, I just want to read one of the questions out directly from the chat. I think it's, it's directly pertinent to this. Is it possible to be thankful for the time you've had together? and be supportive of the remaining family. Yeah. I mean, for me, being thankful was a, is, is a really big part. Um, you know, I, I think for me, you know, having, not having my brother with me anymore, it feels like a loss, but I'm incredibly thankful for all of the years I did have with him. I mean, I'm fortunate that he wasn't really, really young when he died. Um, and yeah, and I am incredibly thankful. Um, but I also learned a lot of lessons from his death in terms of how I want to live the rest of my life as well. And I've made some quite significant life decisions as a result of my brother dying reasonably young to die. You know, he was early mm -hmm. 60s. Um, and so I'm cha I've changed my life and how I'm living it as a result of losing Roy. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, is there anything you'd want to share about that, Simon, just in terms of that thankfulness? Um, so um, I heard myself say uh, to my friend the other day, I've moved now from a position where I believe both my mum and, and my brother, my mum much, much quicker than I did with my brother, but I wish they were alive more than I'm sad they're dead. And, and that sort of sense of, the, the death is 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 uh, uh, the death is the death is certain <laughs> it's happened mm. and I and and so there were lots of moments where I think oh, I really really wish that he was there and actually I I mean the the weirdest thing of course that happens is all the things that I would never have phoned to tell him is the first thing I now do is think I phone Andrew and about six months ago I phoned his number I didn't even know his mobile number somebody else answered the phone and that was yeah the it must have been a year a year ago I was in the, definitely when anyway somebody else answered the phone yeah so obviously his contract had gone and his number had gone somewhere else and it was the oddest 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 thing but it was actually gratitude um, and a um, uh, actually actively practicing gratitude that got me out of the what was essentially a, a fairly dark hole um, six months after. Um, he he died, uh, which was yeah that bit of 
um, being grateful. Um, I decided very early on that I didn't want therapy, that I wanted to feel mm -hmm. the feelings. I wasn't sure that therapy could help me get anywhere. It's different for everybody, but I, I was pretty sure it wasn't going to, to, to work for me. But actually being great, gra practicing gratitude, um, and three things in the morning and three things at night. Um, and I was encouraged to think about one thing a day, which was related to him. And, and I did that and I still do it now. Um, and actually pops up more than once a day quite often. And I saw something earlier about can you romanticize? I mean, it's, it's completely romanticized, you know, in terms of, of all sorts of things. Um, now, and I quite like that. Um, you know, I've got a friend who's whose partner was um, killed in a horse riding accident. And he's like, we wouldn't be together now if Simon was still alive, different Simon. But in my mind, we had the love affair that lasted forever and, you know, and all of those sorts of things. So I think, yeah, there's something about the protection of, of, of romanticization and about the, the freedom, about the flowers and about, not the flowers, you know, the, the bloom, everything that goes with that romanticism. Um, yesterday was Mother's Day and I came back to, Cornwall and we put daffodils on my brother's grave because my mum was cremated because we always gave mum daffodils and suddenly I'm remembering us fighting over the daffodils and mum would get headless <laughs> battered daffodils and yesterday I found myself taking daffodils to, to his grave um, you know and all of those sorts of things I think just go with it you know just enjoy um, enjoy those those things which which help help you know that they are there. I mean, I, 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 I still say that I have a brother, not that I had a brother. Um, it took me a long time to work that out, but I have a brother. He's just not alive anymore. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's part of romanticizing. Um, that's part of keeping it alive in a way which feels comfortable on a day-to-day -day basis. That actually is something mm. that we all shared. What do, the, the, how you describe it. Um, when you first get, the first time you get asked after you're, sibling has died do you have brothers and sisters I literally was speechless the first time I was asked that question because mm. I didn't know what to say and I opened my mouth and no words came out because I couldn't work out what the answer was and then I just started crying much to the poor person's horror because it was a professional professional setting I was in and I and I had to work it through have I right well I know I've got a sister but what I don't know what to say about a brother have I got a brother do I say I did have a brother and, and like Simon, I now say I have a brother and a sister, but my brother's not alive anymore. Um, but I think keeping them alive, I talk about my, I talk about him a lot. Um, and I don't really care if people aren't interested in hearing about him, but I, I talk about him to keep him alive in my, in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a really important part for me of, uh, you know, of keeping him close really just, mm -hmm. and often it's not very flattering at all what I'm talking about, about him, you know, I'm often sharing things that he wouldn't want me to be sharing. Um, but, you know, that's part of how I keep him alive. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing. Really, really uh, appreciate it. And I can see from the chat that lots of people appreciate that too. Um, so thank you. I'm conscious that we need to draw to a close now. Um, and um, do pardon us if we, go, if we go a couple of minutes over time, but I just want to give us the opportunity really um, Simon and, and, and then Julie, I just wondered if there was anything else you'd just like to say as we close, perhaps that you haven't had a chance to say before. Um, Simon, if I can go to you first. Mm. I guess for, for me, two things. Um, one is allow yourself to feel it and, 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 and find ways to encourage yourself to feel it. Uh, you know, is, is, is my sort of bit. And then the other is um, uh, don't ever, uh, don't ever censor yourself if you want to talk because of other people's um, discomfort um, or, or other people's um, fear. And, you know, sometimes, uh, and, I, and I guess just say it, sometimes I hear myself say it as a very early part of the conversation and it's, it's not to cause discomfort, but it feels like it's important. And I, for a while, I tried to stop myself doing that. And then I just thought, if it comes out of your mouth, it's coming out of your mouth for, for, for a reason, for you, not necessarily for, for other people. And then finally, um, cultures and traditions. You know, uh, we, you know, birthdays, Christmases, um, 
Eid, whatever you know, celebrations um, you have, um, not necessarily on on those ones, but creating cultures and traditions um, that enable you to honour, you know, to honour your relationship with them. That relationship still exists, mm. um, you know, in 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 all sorts of ways and 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 finding ways to to enable you to hold that in your heart I think is is really important. Mm. Thank you Simon thanks so much. Julie over to you. Um, yeah I think it would be um, don't 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 try and protect other people from your feeling of grief you, you have a right to the feelings that you have um, and um, and it's important that you find a space to share them and if you don't actually feel like you have something to be talked to writing, journaling, uh, and writing down how you feel is also really cathartic and really, really powerful. Um, but I think that I, the main message is, it is um, really important to talk about these things. Um, and don't deny yourself the ability to talk both about the difficult feelings, but also about the great memories or, you know, difficult memories, whatever it is, there isn't any right or wrong way to deal with, with grief or bereavement. And then the, only, the very last thing I would say is I've been out of the corner of my eye catching some of the chat as it's come up and, and I'm seeing people talking about having lost loved ones during COVID and how that mm. has impacted on them not being able to be part of a ceremony and an ending. And I also just saw um, somebody share that they've lost somebody very close to them uh, this week. Um, so I just wanted to say, you know, do reach out for support um, if you are very early on in the stages of losing somebody. Um, there's, there's, um, it's really important that you are heard. And can I just add, um, yeah. Yeah, because I do have a very specific bit in relation to COVID, um, which obviously with mum um, dying, but um, part of our cultural traditions, whichever, you know, whatever your circumstances oh. COVID has done is to um, uh, reduce the amount of time that you can spend t telling stories in the, you know, the funeral or the cremation or the service so mm -hmm. finding other ways to do so whether that's online condolence books zoom conversations or whatever just that storytelling is is the spirit and and the energy and I would just really encourage people to to recognize that the absence of stories may be contributing to the journey and to find ways if that feels feels appropriate that was certainly the thing that I was like what's happened what's missing Oh, I haven't heard other people's stories. Let's let's seek them out, mm -hmm. and and that's been really helpful. As Judy says, getting support is really, really important. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Simon. Thank you so much, Julie, um, for all of all of your insights. Insights often go <laughs> through on the chat. We just want to attest to that. Thank you, and and thank you also for um, for all that you've shared. That's personal there, um, and also thank you to those that have shared in the chat um, about your experiences. Um, and as Julie said, uh, if, if, you've, if there's a loss you've experienced, um, perhaps even some time ago that your, your feeling is very close, or if it's something close and raw that's, that's happened a, a lot, uh, uh, quite recently, um, then please do reach out. There are, there are organizations, there are people here to support you. Um, but I just wanna, um, be drawing to a close tonight. So once again, I would say thank you so much to Julie. Thank you to Simon. Um, thank you all for being here this evening. And, and also, I just want to thank Beth as well for, for pulling together the event and making sure everything went as well as it possibly could. Sorry about a few of the technical hitches, but that's the, the nature of things, isn't it, at the moment? And we, we bear with and we will push through. So thank you for your patience. Um, just wanted to flag that there'll be the survey monkey coming up uh, in the chat. So if you can just take a moment, it won't take long, just to put in um, your brief feedback, that'll be really helpful because it helps us shape um, the, the webinars to come. Uh, the, the other thing I would just flag is that uh, with any of these webinars, we do invite people to make a small voluntary donation. It just helps us keep the webinars going and covers our, our costs with it to make sure that we can continue to provide these every month. So. Uh, if you can bear that in mind, that would be great. But if you wanted to make a donation through that into your local cruise branch, you can as well. Um, so the website for it is www.cruise.org.uk slash donate. Um, but um, but you'll be able to get through that on the website as well. So 
Uh, once again, oh, thank you so much. Oh, Julie, go on. on yeah. Amazon if people want to get it. Sorry? The book could be bought on Amazon if people want to get it. The book can be bought on Amazon, absolutely. absolutely. And proceeds to cruise. Yeah, proceeds to cruise, absolutely. And there's the, um, there's the link there provided by Simon. Fantastic. So thank you. If you do buy the book, we hope you find it really helpful. I certainly found it very moving and also helpful, really insightful. So thank you. So without further ado, uh, we'll draw to a close this evening. Once again, thank you so much, Julie, Simon. It's, it's been a pleasure to be with you this evening and thank you all. You take care. Take Have care. a good evening. Bye-bye.